Welcome back. Well, the cold weather has come back to my part of the world. So what better to do than stay inside, drink some coffee, and make some more YouTube videos. Now, everybody loves a great comeback story, a redemption arc, and rock and roll is no exception. So today I'm going to talk about three artists or bands that many people had written off but managed to pull a rabbit out of a hat, so to speak, and come back stronger than ever. So before we get into it, please take a moment to do the YouTube stuff, like the video, subscribe if you're not. It's amazing how many people consistently watch YouTube channels but never subscribe. That would be really helpful. Buy me a coffee and PayPal links are in the description of the video if you'd like to make a financial contribution in any amount. Thanks so much, and let's do it. To say that Ozzy Osbourne had hit a personal low point in his life when he was unceremoniously kicked out of Black Sabbath in 1979 would be a gross understatement. Keep in mind, Black Sabbath was a band that were known for being heavy drinkers and doing mountains of cocaine, and yet Ozzy was kicked out of this group for being too unreliable. By all accounts, Ozzy proceeded to spend an extended period living a sort of Brian Wilson-like existence in a squalid hotel room cluttered with pizza delivery boxes, staying in bed all day, getting high, and generally feeling sorry for himself, thinking that his music career was over. Then one day, Ozzy received a visit from Sharon Arden. Now, Sharon was the daughter of Don Arden, a hard-nosed music business impresario who had managed Black Sabbath and was actually the guy that had fired Ozzy from the band. So against her father's wishes, she started dating Ozzy, encouraged him to get back on his feet and start making music again, and became his manager and eventually his wife. In the weeks and months that followed, Ozzy and Sharon assembled a group that consisted of Randy Rhodes on guitar, Bob Daisley on bass, Lee Kerslake on drums, and Don Airy on keyboards. Now, all great players, but of course, Rhodes was the real key element. In the two albums he played on in Osborne's group, he amassed a body of work that places him among the most loved and respected heavy metal guitar players to this day. This album was a runaway commercial success. It contains the song Crazy Train, easily Ozzy's best-known tune from his solo career. Obviously, some of the Sabbath stuff rivals it in popularity. It's gone four times platinum, and Rolling Stone has placed it at number nine on their list of the top 100 metal albums of all time. Pretty cool for a guy who thought his career was over just prior to the recording of this one. I think it's important to note that this album goes beyond just heavy metal. Ozzy's always had a great ear for melody. He grew up idolizing the Beatles, so that's probably not too surprising. One of my favorites is the ballad Goodbye to Romance. I always took the lyrics at face value. I assumed it was about a romance coming to an end. But Ozzy has revealed that he actually wrote it as a goodbye to his bandmates in Sabbath, which I think is pretty cool. It's a pretty simple little tune in the key of D major. Randy wisely uses a D major seventh to start a couple of different inversions, in fact. And then a bit higher. The major sevenths always give a very tender feel. We get a nice little A with a C-sharp bass. That's the five chord. G slash B. And then A7 brings us back to our one chord. Yesterday. 
day has been and gone Tomorrow will I find the sun Or will it rain? Everybody's having fun Except me, I'm the lonely one I live in shame the fact that U2's prior album to this one, Rattle and Hum, sold about 14 million, you may find it odd that I would include Octung Baby on a video about comeback records. But hear me out on this. Up until this point, U2 had been critical darlings. They really couldn't do wrong. And Rattle and Hum, I think, was the first one that met with mixed reviews from the critics. It somehow felt like maybe for the first time the band was sort of treading water. Personally, I've never been a huge fan of mixed live and studio albums. Rattle and Hum is one. It opens with a cover of Helter Skelter, which I feel is pretty lackluster. I don't know what it is about that song. It seems like everyone's covered it and they're all horrible. Besides you 2 you've got Pat Benatar, Motley Crue. I never liked any of them. Rattle and Hum also contain collaborations with American roots music icons like Bob Dylan and B.B. King. Many critics trash this idea, saying that it was pretentious and that the relatively young band was putting itself on the same level as these icons. I never really bought into that criticism. More than anything, I just didn't need to hear you 2 playing the blues. I don't think it's their forte. Which brings us back to the main subject of this segment, Octung Baby. The band took around three years in the making of this one. And I think that too adds to the whole comeback vibe of this record. You get the sense that they knew the last record was a bit of a misstep and they really wanted to get it right. The style of this album could best be described as alternative, slash industrial, slash electronic dance. They really reinvented themselves for this one. Overall, the lyrical subject matter is darker than it had been. One of my favorites is Until the End of the World, which, believe it or not, is an imaginary conversation between Judas Iscariot and Jesus Christ. It's really cleverly done, and Bono includes some sexual imagery in there, I think just to leave it a little bit open to interpretation. Verse 1 deals with the Last Supper. We ate the food, we drank the wine, everybody having a good time, except you. You were talking about the end of the world. Verse 2 recounts Judas' betrayal of Christ with a kiss. In the garden I was playing the tart. I kissed your lips and I broke your heart. You, you were acting like it was the end of the world. And verse 3 is about the sorrow that Judas feels after the crucifixion. In my dream I was drowning sorrows, but my sorrows they learned to swim. Waves of regret and waves of joy. I reached out for the one I tried to destroy. You, you said that you'd wait until the end of the world. Meanwhile, Mysterious Ways and One were both smash hits. Mysterious Ways hit number one. It's got a great electronic dance feel. And One is one of those tracks that just feels like a classic from the first time you hear it. Is it getting better? Or do you feel the same? Will it make 
make it easier on you now You got someone to blame You say One love One life When it's one need In the night Octum Baby produced five successful singles of course, it was a U.S. number one and has sold around 18 million all told. So definitely topping Rattle and Hum in that regard. And second only to the Joshua Tree's 25 million in the U2 catalog. Fornication was the seventh studio album from the Red Hot Chili Peppers, and it really marked the band's triumphant return back to the top of the alternative rock heap. And for me, it's really all down to one man, guitarist John Frusciante. The Chili Peppers released their first album way back in 1984 and made quite a stir in sort of underground music circles with their first three albums the last two of which featured Israeli-American guitarist Hillel Slovak. But following Slovak's death from an accidental heroin overdose, the band recruited Frusciante on guitar for the first time, and that's when they began to really make progress commercially. They recorded the album Mother's Milk, which featured the single Higher Ground, a great cover of the old Stevie Wonder classic on steroids as well as Knock Me Down, another great tune. And then came Blood Sugar Sex Magic, which absolutely exploded, selling 14 million and skyrocketing the band to worldwide success. But unfortunately, that's when the guitar player troubles started again. For Shante became disillusioned with the band's runaway success, developed a bad heroin addiction, ended up homeless and nearly dead, and was forced to leave the band. That must have been really difficult for the rest of the band to accept, losing yet another talented guitar player to heroin. After a four-year gap, the band recruited Dave Navarro, formerly of Jane's Addiction, to play guitar, and released One Hot Minute, which was a pretty decent album, sold okay, but I think we all felt deep down that Navarro, as great as he is, is more of a hard rock guy. He just never quite jived with the funky feel of the Red Hot Chili Peppers. And then after yet another four-year hiatus, the seemingly impossible happened. The triumphant return of John Frusciante to the group. He had finally managed to clean himself up and the release of Californication, which would go on to be their best-selling album of all, topping even Blood Sugar Sex Magic, something I didn't think was possible. But it's plain to see, whenever John Frusciante is involved, good things happen for the Red Hot Chili Peppers. I played a little snippet of Scar Tissue in the intro. That's a classic Frusciante guitar part there. Kind of quirky and playful, but with a strong hint of sadness as well. That song is about the difficulties of maintaining sobriety, meaningless sexual encounters, shooting up in bathroom stalls, blood loss in a bathroom stall, southern girl with a scarlet drawl, wave goodbye to ma and pa, because with the birds I'll share this lonely viewing. And of course, Chili Pepper's bassist Flea is fun as always, he makes his presence known right from the opening track around the world with a distorted bass tone that sounds like he could be playing through Motorhead bass player Lemmy's Marshall amp setup. And then there's the title track, a somber little piece in A minor. California is a very beautiful place in many ways, but there's a sinister undertone there, particularly in places like L.A., 
that these guys capture perfectly with this one. A darkness lurking just beneath the surface of sunshine, palm trees, and movie stars. I love the pre-chorus. Pay your surgeon very well to break the spell of aging. Celebrity skin, is this your chin or is that war you're waging? Firstborn unicorn, hardcore soft porn. Dream of Californication. And the next verse, marry me girl, be my fairy to the world, be my very own constellation. A teenage bride with a baby inside getting high on information. And buy me a star on the boulevard, it's Californication. Psychic spies from China try to steal your mind's elation. Little girls from Sweden dream of silver screen quotations. And if you want these kind of dreams, it's Californication. It's the edge of the world in all of Western civilization. The sun may rise in the east, at least it's settled in a fine location. It's understood that Hollywood sells Californication. 